Many libraries. I'm Greg Wiedemann. I'm the University Archivist here at UAlbany, um, and our archives is right around the corner. Um, and no, my office is not messy. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but we have a nice exhibit on our death penalty collections, too, um, if you could check it out, too. Um, I very much suggest it. So I have the awesome job of introducing our great panelists this morning. Uh, first up, we're going to do one at a time. First up, we're going to do our Skype um, uh, speaker. And first is uh, Rupika Rassam. Uh, who's an English professor at and faculty fellow for digital library initiatives at Salem State University, where she also serves as coordinator of the graduate certificate in digital studies, coordinator of the combined BA and uh, master's in English education, and interim coordinator of the MA in English. Her research interests lie at the intersections of post-colonial and African diaspora studies, humanities, knowledge, infrastructures, and di digital humanities and new media. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm glad to be able to, to speak with you on this panel today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing at Salem State University to build a digital humanities initiative at a public institution with no money, and particularly around some of the ethical challenges that we've encountered around labor. So at Salem State, we have developed the Digital Scholars Program, which is an undergraduate digital humanities research program that responds to the university's commitment to student success. And we don't have a lot of opportunities for research for undergraduates who aren't in the honors program, and the honors program is limited in size unnecessarily by, by finances. So we conceived of the initiative as a way of bringing the opportunity to do digital humanities research to students who otherwise may not have the opportunity uh, to work more closely with faculty in the archives uh, or on research. But doing this work revealed a number of challenges. Uh, first of all, there aren't a lot of models for doing digital humanities research at regional comprehensive universities. Uh, a lot of the focus is on flagship public uh, research universities and elite liberal arts colleges. Uh, so we had to kind of make up what we were doing as we were going along. There's also a, a difficulty in creating a culture of ethical faculty and librarian partnerships, uh, particularly because some of the inequalities in labor um, that already exist across units in the university. So I'm going to talk about how we have managed successful partnerships uh, between librarians and faculty, uh, as well as some of the challenges. So regional comprehensive universities like Salem State tend to focus on teaching and on serving students in our region. We are the most diverse public institution in Massachusetts and serve a primarily undergraduate student population of 7,600 uh, through 32 degree programs in liberal arts and business and allied health and education, social work. We have master's degrees in some of these areas. Uh, but it's primarily undergraduate. Uh, so our work was focused around how to develop digital humanities initiatives with really instrumental value for our undergraduate student population. So we don't have students who have a lot of time outside of their school commitments and their substantial working schedules and their family commitments. I don't have time to, to sort of in, enjoy so what we often think of as integral to the college experience, a time to, to sort of think and, 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 and grow. And so we've tried to, to create that for them. Um, so Salem State transitioned from being a college, a state college, to a, a state university in 2010, along with the other state colleges in our, in our system. And in Massachusetts, it's a, there's a, there's a three-tier system. So there's the University of Massachusetts system, which gets all the money, the uh, state, state universities, and the community colleges. So all the state universities became universities in 2010. And we've been trying to negotiate uh, the changing institutional identity that comes from that shift. 
And part of that is that our faculty and our librarians, who are all, um, all our librarians are tenure uh, track or tenured librarians. And we have tenure track faculty, adjunct faculty as well, of course. But our, our tenure line faculty and librarians have always had to demonstrate uh, that they're meritorious in uh, teaching or development of library programs, um, service, and research uh, for tenure and promotion. But what's happened at the university is that the expectations in the area of research have increased without any corresponding decrease in responsibilities. So no lower teaching loads for faculty, no hiring of additional librarians to spread the work. And uh, these are, of course, the result of fiscal constraints because we've seen a significant decline in funding from the Massachusetts State Legislature since uh, 2001. And in particular, because of this, the number of librarians at Salem State has decreased 25% since 2008 as people leave or people retire and the positions just don't get filled. Uh, so with uh, our, our digital uh, humanities initiatives, uh, we're trying to respond to the need for increased research and increased blending of, of teaching and research by working with our students. Um, we've done this primarily as a collaboration between me. I am uh, an associate professor, uh, I just got tenure, um, of, of education and of English. Uh, our archivist, Susan Edwards, who's actually an alum of the library school at, at SUNY Albany and our digital initiatives librarian, Justin Snow. And so the three of us have simply done this work on top of our already full job descriptions. We've just had to carve out time where we can or just do extra work. Um, it's just not part of our responsibilities, but we've found that this is a really meaningful experience for the students. So we've been willing, willing to do it. Um, but then what's come down to is this question of how do we create ethical collaborative labor practices uh, that respond to these specific needs of a university that's focused on teaching that is underfunded and has an underserved student population. Uh, and, and we're reflected very much of other regional universities um, in this in this way. And as I'm finding, particularly as I as I speak with colleagues at other public institutions, even uh, non universities that aren't technically regional comprehensive have similar um, challenges that that we face. Uh, the kinds of projects uh, in digital humanities that we do at Salem State and also at other regional comprehensive universities, which we uh, found out through, um, oh, we received an NEH grant a few years ago to build uh, connections between other digital humanities practitioners at regional comprehensive universities. We have very similar um, similar missions and similar models. So our, our research in digital humanities tends to focus on undergraduate education. We tend to do small projects that are beneficial uh, to our colleges and to our regional communities. And libraries are at the forefront of these activities unequivocally. So uh, in Massachusetts, uh, libraries at every uh, state institution has supported some form of digital scholarship. Uh, the largest institutions like ours have been able to hire digital initiatives librarians and create institutional repositories to promote open access to student and faculty research into our special collections. Um, and at Salem State, we made the library the heart of our work in digital humanities. Uh, we couldn't run the digital scholars program or our other digital humanities programs without the resources to so the collections, the expertise, the intellectual leadership that is located in our library. Uh, but despite the significance of libraries uh, to the university's digital humanities initiatives, inequities in labor expected from librarians, particularly contrasted with faculty expectations, have proposed challenges uh, to our partnerships. So um, in the union contract for the state universities, the librarians and faculty are considered to be the same. We're all governed by the same contract, but then there are these strange ways that on the ground and in the realities of our work, it doesn't really work out to be equitable. So 
obviously one is that the librarians are 12 month uh, faculty and we faculty uh, and um, the tenure online faculty are nine month so fac these faculty tend to disappear <laughs> Um, for three months at a time when they are off contract and uh, people really just do not show up and librarians are still working and so there's a challenge there around the continuity and sustainability of digital humanities initiatives over time it's not really optimal and so like stop working on things for three months it's hard to keep the momentum uh, and there's also the issue of um, compensation so because of the union environment, faculty inten uh, the uh, faculty teaching faculty uh, can receive will receive additional compensation for any work that falls outside the boundaries of our contractual work. But for some reason, the university refuses to pay librarians for work that falls outside of their uh, contractual duties and outside of their job descriptions. So there's very little incentive to take on more work when you're not being compensated, and particularly if you're working in collaboration uh, between me and the archivist, for example, where I can get paid, and our archivist can't get paid, and she is contributing really important intellectual leadership, capital, um, and time uh, to the projects as well. And aside from this, we have this very typical um, issue around this expectation of faculty that librarians are there to serve them. The service culture uh, of librarianship has been typically strong at the university and trying to change that has been an interesting challenge. Uh, one of the things that attracted me uh, to digital humanities scholarship is that uh, digital humanities has put a focus on trying to change this challenge of service model with attention to collaboration and to labor ethics. So from the very beginning of our conversations around creating the digital scholars program and developing an institutional digital humanities project uh, called Digital Salem to which these, these undergraduate researchers are contributing, uh, we emphasize that our relationship between each other as colleagues should be one characterized by collaboration and not by service. And so throughout our collaboration, we put these labor issues at the forefront of our work to try and change them and change the culture. Uh, so uh, essentially, um, the program itself, uh, we began uh, by designing through trial and error again, because they're not really great models for regional comprehensive universities. And we piloted the program in the 2015-2016 academic year funded by a small grant from our strategic initiatives um, grant program, which provides grants to create cross-unit collaboration, cross-departmental collaboration. And we made the case that the Digital Scholars Program would contribute to student success through an innovative educational experience that uh, advanced their intellectual and personal and professional growth. So in the program, students from a range of departments, so English, history, geography, education, um, computer science have the opportunity to learn more about digital humanities and how it might complement their educational experiences and their career goals. So they've gotten access to a really innovative interdisciplinary educational experience. We emphasize building 21st century literacy skills, so collaboration and communication and critical thinking and problem solving, creativity and digital literacy. Um, we give them interdisciplinary experiences, uh, bringing together STEM skills and humanities research methods. Um, we bring in career services as well uh, to talk to them about how to translate the experiences they have in the program and to cover letters and for job interviews. Um, and uh, so really we're thinking about this from the perspective of being a university where students are coming to the university for very utilitarian reasons. They're looking for upward mobility. They're looking for career prospects. And so uh, we've had to think about very instrumental ways of making the case that the, their participation in the program will be useful for them and help them uh, you know, be prepared for jobs in the knowledge economy, uh, be prepared for jobs you can't even imagine yet. So uh, 
This then came back to another issue around ethics of labor, which is, um, you know, we have these students working on these projects, right? And they're not getting paid. And they're not, uh, they're actually paying for course credit because the way the program works is the students are, um, are mentored through the process of doing independent research and they're paying for course credit. Uh, so it was very important to us that we put them at the center of the projects as intellectual leaders themselves. That they would gain experience uh, working with the literature and history and culture of Salem by designing and implementing digital humanities projects that are drawing on our archival collections and connect their experiences uh, in primarily humanities majors to digital, digital literacy, but that we needed to step back. We needed to be mentors, not project directors. We needed to uh, shepherd the students' intellectual growth as researchers and as the intellectual leads on the project and put aside whatever it is that we hoped would come out of the uh, digital humanities projects made with our archival collections. Uh, so, this is part of the sort of question of how do we develop these ethical labor practices, um, not only for faculty and librarians, but for also for, for students. Uh, there's a really interesting way that these are, that these kind of questions of labor are all connected to each other. So on the one hand, we have this issue of how faculty can be compensated and librarians can't be compensated. So um, through our grant funding, for example, we've been able to have the opportunity to receive money for this work. But this money through payroll could only be distributed to me and not to my partner. And so the way we got around that was actually just to pay me. And then it turns out that you can give someone up to $26,000 as a gift and still be okay with the IRS. So my, my colleague who's the archivist has received some gifts <laughs> after taxes. So everything's completely above the board. I mean, the only way we could compensate her for the work is pay me and then I give her, you know, half in cash and an envelope and like a back <laughs> It's like really just just pay her right um, but because effectively running the program is drawn on both of our experiences both of our unique st skill sets and it's really very much because digital humanities functions best when it's working at the heart uh, at the intersections of libraries um, and humanities right um, not just libraries or humanities but at the intersections of these um, so that was sort of one one issue um, I mentioned already the student, um, the issue around student labor. Uh, so we really uh, draw inspiration from the Student Collaborators Bill of Rights, which specifies that a student uh, must be paid for his or her time, for, for their time if they're not empowered to make critical decisions about the intellectual design of a project or a portion of a project and credited accordingly. So that's how we ended up designing the project as an undergraduate research program rather than a digital humanities internship program, which had actually been what we had originally wanted to do. Originally, we were hoping to have ways to pay them to work on projects with paid internships, but the simply then the university had a budget crisis and that didn't happen. So um, the students are the intellectual leaders um, of the project. So many work with us for a semester. Some work with us for an entire academic year. At the beginning of the semester, we introduce them to the theoretical dimensions of, of archival studies and of digital humanities. We can give them a conceptual grounding in the methods that they'll be using in their research. They explore our collections for the first few weeks of the semester. They identify a topic of interest. They, we start mentoring them, developing research questions, and then kind of take them iteratively throughout the process of developing a really, really small scale digital humanities project. So we've had students doing work on the history of activism at the university. We've had students doing work on uh, curricular changes um, when Salem State was first established as a normal school uh, in 1854. Uh, we've had students doing 3D modeling of 
sites on campus, uh, all because this was what interested them and what excited them when they got their hands on the archival materials and then we sort of worked with them to, to, to help them design it into a project. Uh, so we, we, we try to take a step back and, and, and sort of, these are students who, you know, because of, of, of demographics, because of their K-12 education, don't really come believing that they're empowered thinkers and we want them to, to realize that they are um, to so we, we take that very seriously but then when we bring other faculty into it things get a little bit complicated uh, because you know the the turns out that the labor expectations that faculty have were not the ones that we have they often think of students as free labor they were really looking for people to crunch their their numbers to code their data. Um, and we really push back against these practices. We're not like free labor factory for faculty who don't want to do their own stuff and can't get money to do it, pay someone else to do it, right? This is not what we're offering our students. We're trying to offer our students the opportunity to be intellectual leaders and to see themselves in that way. So, um, and faculty do this to us too. It's been really weird to be a faculty member in this role. So over time with the we got a new library dean and she's very supportive of our work and so uh, we were able to actually get any course release time to do this work of course we couldn't of course release time to uh, our archivist because she doesn't teach courses although we were able to hire an assistant uh, part-time to work and help her out as well so she has more more help too um, but because i'm in this role where i'm this faculty fellow of the library uh, when i'm in that role uh, I'm treated like a librarian in a very negative sense. Nothing, none of the good stuff about being librarians. I'm treated like someone you can hand your data and be and tell them go make me a digital humanities project. And I say, well, I'm not a historian. You, know, you can just give me your data, expect me to do this. So um, we've been trying to create a culture of like, working together, and we don't work with people who expect us or our students to just do their work for them if they don't want to work collaboratively with us. Uh, we ran a faculty learning community to start a campus conversation on collaboration to try and model and seed ethical labor practices and equitable values for collaboration across roles and across units in the university. Um, and because we've done this, more partnerships have emerged. Uh, and it's been really positive. Uh, we've been able to, to articulate guidelines for fostering, fostering ethical collaborations at the university. Um, and uh, recently we were able just to get a grant from, a large grant actually, from the Board of Higher Education uh, to um, do some professional development work with faculty also around how do we, uh, and with the administrators, around how do we evaluate this scholarship, this collaborative scholarship and tenure promotion for librarians and for faculty. Uh, so I just want to leave you with a few of the key takeaways that, that have come out of our work, um, out of how to do this kind of ethical collaboration. I mean, the first one is choose your collaborators wisely. I feel like I say this and then I somehow keep failing to do this right, but uh, assess the culture of librarians and faculty and student collaboration at your institution. Think about what are the structural factors, like for us it's the union contract, it's the campus culture that are influencing partnerships. And you have to do a lot of due diligence as well about asking colleagues to describe their experiences working with potential collaborators. And I keep forgetting to do this and every time I forget to do this I realize like, Oh, right, I really should have asked somebody before I agreed to do that thing. Um, the next is to test the waters. Before committing to a substantial partnership, start really small. Test your collaboration with a proof of concept. Proof of concept's great, even just for trying to figure out if the project's a good idea, but it's also really good for figuring out if collaboration is a good idea. Uh, this is a great way to test out whether you and the collaborators uh, share uh, ethical values that are at the heart of the labor that you're going to be doing. And if there are areas of divergence, just think about whether is this a discrepancy that's a deal breaker that you need to walk away from, or is this simply a matter of further conversation to clarify. And next is codify those expectations using project charters. 
So a project charter, if you don't know, is an agreement laid out among all collaborators that indicates the project objectives, the roles of all the participants, uh, the knowledge and the skills that the all the collaborators have and will commit to building, and how credit is going to be assigned to the collaboration. And this is another place to negotiate any concerns that came up while testing the waters, while doing your proof of concept, to um, think about how you're going to, to form a collaboration. Um, and finally, value your own collaborations and the contributions of your partners. Because the success of an effective partnership really comes out of shared values and leveraging the unique skills and the knowledge that everybody possesses and to respecting that and recognizing that the, the sum is greater than all of its parts. And so key to this is, is this key, always keeping in your mind, everybody working on the partnership is an intellectual leader who brings their experience, their skills, their training, and their disciplinary knowledge to the collaboration. And that archives and libraries and information sites, these, this is disciplinary knowledge as well. Uh, so our experience suggests that these principles for effective partnerships don't necessarily automatically translate to the power-laden transactions between faculty and librarians and students at universities. So we had to really take a direct role in modeling and shaping expectations for ethical collaborations. Um, but doing so, we've really been able to do that. And in doing so, we've been able to help transform some of the attitudes around collaboration and labor at the university. Thank you. My name is Amy. I'm the Digital Scholarship Librarian at Binghamton University. Um, and just for show of hands for me, uh, raise your hand if you're working in the libraries. Okay, okay, great. Lots of librarians in the house. Awesome. Um, so again, how many of you are currently working to establish digital scholarship or digital humanities services in your libraries? Awesome. Yeah, us too. <laughs> Um, my talk today is basically uh, just to give an overview of what we've been doing at Binghamton so far. We're still in the earlier stages of establishing our digital scholarship services and um, just talk about you know one way that we've done to work to get it established. It's not the only way you can do it, but it's it worked for us and um, maybe worth trying at your place as well. So defining digital scholarship in itself can be difficult. Um, digital scholarship is an umbrella term and it incorporates a variety of services, ideas, and technology. Um, I created a little word map over here of how different institutions define digital scholarship and a lot of the times it includes the words digital and scholarship. Um, <laughs> research, technology, humanities, service, support, future, data, um, center, uh, so at Binghamton, we still keep our definition broad as well, uh, as we are serving a variety of backgrounds and expertise, uh, while also still being in these learning stages of what would be valuable to the people on our campus. Um, so we define it as making use of digital tools and methods to view research, scholarship, and pedagogy in new and different ways. Uh, so. In case some of you aren't familiar, too familiar with Binghamton, we are part of the SUNY system, as Albany is as well. Uh, we have about 17,500 students, about 14,000 of them undergraduate, 3,500 graduate students. Um, we're made up of six different schools, and we also have four campus locations. So although our central library is on the main campus, not all of our patrons come to main campus. So one of the things we're working to figure out with digital scholarship is how do we serve the students and faculty that aren't coming to our main campus, how do we reach the people who are going to these other locations and still provide them the same services we are providing people at our main campus? Um, so before, before I arrived at Binghamton, um, the, the libraries, along with members of teaching faculty, two of which are here today, um, began talks about the growing needs for digital scholarship and digital humanity services at Binghamton. Um, this group brought in speakers and offered workshops to get the wheels in motion. One thing this led to was the creation of a new position, uh, which brought me back to Binghamton. I'm actually a local from there, uh, in January 2018. 
So being the first in my role, I decided we needed to take a step back and spend the spring of 2018 putting together a bit of a literature review of what others are doing, visit some of the other institutions, and conduct a needs assessment on campus. I started the needs assessment by meeting with our subject librarians to learn more about their interactions with their departments, how they see digital scholarship playing a role for their faculty and students, and any names of faculty that they would recommend that I meet with next, just to get the ball rolling. Um, I then put together a list of these faculty and met with them one-on-one, -on -one, either in their office or over a cup of coffee or tea, and talked about their research, what they know about digital scholarship already, and where they see gaps in services that we may be able to help fill. I also attended as many campus events as I could to introduce myself and make others aware that these new services exist in the libraries and that we're still working to make them as widely available. So from summer of 2018 until now, we've put together a few different things to kick off the growth of our services uh, and the campus digital scholarship and digital humanities community. Uh, one of the things we've done uh, in partnership with Nancy Um, who has a session later today, uh, the Binghamton D DHRI Digital Humanities Research Institute was a four-day workshop this past May where we had 17 participants, uh, a mix of our campus faculty and graduate students interested in digital humanities. Uh, we had a couple colleagues from Albany also come down and join us for part of the DHRI. The institute included seminar-type sessions and hands-on workshops on topics such as data visualization, digital mapping, Python, and digital publishing platforms. We also invited instructors from Cornell Libraries who taught sessions on the command line and text analysis, and lecturers from CUNY Graduate Center and Columbia University. Uh, Nancy and I also had two graduate assistants who were very helpful with us, and um, I couldn't say strongly enough, our library system support is amazing, so they were very helpful in keeping this going as well. Um, it was developed based on a 10-day train the trainer type workshop that Nancy and I went to at the CUNY Graduate Center that they will be offering again uh, in one of the upcoming summers and it's funded by the National Endowment of the Humanities. And these are just a couple pictures from the DHRI, uh, our group on the last day because in Binghamton we don't see sun very much on the screen. Um, so we took advantage of the clear day and you can actually see our uh, Priscilla and Jesus from Albany are up there in the picture as well. And then on the right are two of our two members of our co-sponsors on campus. Um, they came to some of the sessions as well just to see how it was going with the participants and learn more about the tools we were showing them. We've also offered a few workshops on campus. Um, one being a data management planning workshop where we educate on research data management best practices and also show our faculty how to use the DMP tool. This workshop came about from the needs assessment I ran. I had a, an untenured faculty member uh, who was on the tenure track tell me that he was in his first year and part of his tenure process is he has to get a grant. However, he doesn't know how to write a data management plan, has never heard of a data management plan, and doesn't have anybody really there to support and show him how to do it. Um, so I mentioned to him, you know, we, we have uh, access to DMP tool, and that got, really, got him really excited, so I talked to our scholarly communications librarian, and we decided to put together this workshop. The first semester we ran it, we filled up uh, within the first hour, and we hadn't even posted it across any of our uh, university channels yet. So. It's now a workshop we're offering every semester. Um, some workshops that came from the DHRI as well, we've been invited to some different working groups on campus to teach them about OpenRefine, Tableau. Um, we've had open office hours for our participants to set them up on Reclaim Hosting and help them build their professional web pages on WordPress. And Nancy and I have a workshop where we are invited by the graduate community of scholars to come teach them how to use Scalar and add a digital component to their theses. Um, so another thing we've been working on is our open repository and um, the ORB is an open platform for our faculty and students to promote, share, and archive their scholarly and creative works. The ORB has given faculty and students a chance to share both published scholarly research and their creative endeavors, including photo exhibitions, an auto archive of a student radio show on campus, showcase other types of digital collections, and create and manage student journals. 
Um, since all SUNY campuses are being required to create and implement an open access policy by March of 2020, um, at Binghamton we already have ours approved by the Faculty Senate in December 2018. Um, so one thing the Scholar Communications Librarian and I have been doing is going on a roadshow to departments to just explain what is open access and how are we here to help you by sharing your work through the orb. Um, there's been a growing amount of collaborations as well, which is great. Uh, these are just some of the groups that are on campus, uh, both in and outside of the libraries that have been supportive and com collaborative when it comes to digital scholarship. I hope that moving forward, we can have more across collaborations occur across these groups to put together events, lectures and workshops, and any other opportunities that may become valuable for our campus. Um, and since the, the DHRI, uh, the libraries and the STAE have helped support us with a data visualization interest group that we just started last month. Um, I've also taught digital schools in classrooms for faculty wishing to have a digital component to student projects. And this semester I will be floating in a classroom for a professor who actually wants to try teaching a tool to her students for the first time and just have me there to help support. Um, so our Digital Scholarship Center is a project that's in the planning stages. Currently we have a Digital Scholarship Center working group that's made up of five librarians with a plan to add faculty and students to the group in the future. Uh, this group has gone on site visits to other institutions who are at different stages of this process to learn more about what has been valuable in their space. And in our pilot space, we plan to have VR equipment available for use, flexible furniture, glass whiteboards, and open hours for consultations. The goal is to use this time to gain a better understanding of what we can offer in our future space that would be essential to our campus community. Consultation services have also received an increase uh, since both the passing of the open access policy and the DHRI taking place. Um, faculty have reached out for recommendations on digital tools to use in their research and to teach the students in their classrooms, including uh, Omeka S, Timeline JS, the Orb. Uh, we're doing some work with possibly Perma CC to offer as a service. And uh, one recommendation, recommendation I make for digital scholarship folks uh, in the libraries is. I, I do have this boundary that I make with consultations. I'm here to help you and give you recommendations, but I'm not here to do the research for you. Um, I can show you how to use the tool, but you still have to go and discover your own research yourself with it. So now that I've told you about a few of the hats I wear in digital scholarship, um, this is the cluster of roles that I see involved in the digital scholarship librarian's life. Um, to sum it up, a digital scholarship librarian is a consultant. Uh, you're there to offer guidance on digital platforms and tools. We are researchers, learning about what others are doing in the field regularly, as this is a growing and ever-changing area. We are collaborators on research in the classroom, for presentations, and for continuing education development. We are instructors, teaching others how to use digital platforms and tools for use in their research and how to integrate it into their teaching practices. We're also mentors. We're mentors to other librarians who are working to implement digital scholarship services at their institutions, and also mentors for faculty and students who are interested in using this in their future careers or for teaching in their classrooms. And of course, we're students. We are forever students. New tools are constantly being developed and needs for our faculty and students change as time goes on. And this is actually one of my favorite hats to be wearing because I enjoy continuously hearing about new tools from people and getting to try it out and see what we can do with it. Um, and sometimes uh, I'll show a faculty or student how to use a tool and they'll come back to me and say, oh, did you know you could do this? And it's fantastic. And then they're teaching me how to use some of these tools. So just some recommendations, uh, how success is defined and what is sustainable, what sustainability looks like will depend on the needs of your institution. Um, the needs assessment help us know where to start for our services and having support from our administration and college, colleagues has also been a major factor. 
um, advocacy by those who have, we have already brought into our digital scholarship and digital humanities communities has been an asset and um, we have had more people coming to some of our open office hours and workshops uh, who have heard from others or uh, who heard from others even our co-sponsors who weren't even participants that you know these great things are happening and you should see what's going on for Binghamton uh, you know we're we're still in the growing stages, um, but for long-term sustainability, I see us needing more people to help with these services. Um, currently, I'm a, a one-woman service, and that can only go so far as we move forward if we want to make this grow. And if you are, it uh, looks like a lot of people are local to this area, um, so just a couple events that are coming up that if you're interested in attending, they are free. Um, there's a library carpentry one happening on October 25th in Oneonta where you can learn about intro to data and open refine and it's open to academics, community members, people uh, working in public libraries, school libraries. So it's a, a good chance to meet others and also earn, learn just a little bit more about research data and a data cleaning tool. There's also that camp happening on the same day in Syracuse which is an unconference for those interested in digital humanities. Um, this I've never gone to an unconference, so I'm actually pretty excited to see this. Uh, it looks it looks like a good a good group coming so far, so far, but they have space as well. And any any uh, you don't have to be somebody who's already working in the field. If it's just an interest of yours, you're still welcome to come and share and learn. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Bridget Waring, uh, an assistant professor at Binghamton University where she teaches in the English department and in the Medieval Studies program. Her research interests include later medieval English literature, long history of text technologies, manuscripts, and digitization in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Previously, she was a clear postdoc um, in data curation for medieval studies at Stanford University Libraries where she worked on uh, metadata for the Experimental Digital Manuscripts Hub DMS Index. Thank you. Take it away. Um, and Rupika, I'm going to take a moment to do what Amy did. I'm a big fan. It's really great to meet you like this. Looking forward to meeting you in person someday. Um, <laughs> my slides, like everyone else's slides, will be up in the repository. So if the beheading of the, uh, them bothers you now, you'll be able to see the complete set soon. Uh, the uh, argument in the title of my talk is not new. Um, in fact, it's pretty old news that those of us engaged in digital scholarship face significant challenges in hiring, tenure, and promotion. While I'm not breaking news in announcing these challenges, I think that one of the things that is missing from many 10,000 foot view discussions of digital scholarship is the view from very specific pieces of ground. Uh, today, I'm going to speak today about the day-to-day -day and on-the-ground experiences that promote or inhibit the uptake of digital scholarship by faculty working in traditional academic departments without the protections of tenure. In my time, I'm going to begin by unpacking some of the local conditions that have led me and many others in my hiring cohort to postpone digital scholarship until after tenure, or at least until we feel that we have met tenure requirements for analog scholarship and are therefore free to engage in digital scholarship. Then. I'm going to offer a kind of speculative fiction, a counter-narrative of my alternative tenure timeline in a parallel universe, uh, and the kinds of digital scholarship I would have engaged in over the last four or five years had I felt that digital scholarship would be rewarded locally. Part one, uh, written authority versus lived experience. This is the job ad that brought me to Binghamton. As an argument of local support for digital scholarship, this ad would seem to suggest that the person hired for this position, a person whose active research agenda engages with new digital technologies in the study of medieval literature, would be expected to continue developing that research agenda. But starting with my campus visit, it became clear to me that one of the things that made me an appealing candidate for this position was the fact that my first major research output was a book. In other words, I was competitive for a medieval studies and digital humanities position because at least early on in my career, I would not have to do digital scholarship. Neither the medieval studies program, in which I do half of my teaching and the bulk of my service, nor the English department, in which I do the other half of my teaching and which is my tenure home, have written criteria for tenure, let alone written criteria for assessing digital scholarship for tenure and promotion. Instead, 
both defer to the Binghamton University Faculty Handbook Statement on Tenure Criteria. This looks promising, welcoming even. But my on-the-ground experiences and an unscientific survey of other pre-tenure faculty suggest that in practice our institution is rather less supportive. In what follows, names have been removed and details anonymized. Pre-tenure colleagues who have trusted me with their stories do not want to be perceived as ungrateful or troublemakers when they go up for tenure. One of my colleagues was told by his chair to do no digital scholarship until he had accrued enough traditional publications to be assured of tenure. Digital scholarship, she said, would not help him for tenure. Another was told by her chair that she could do digital scholarship, but a successfully funded and completed digital scholarship, uh, digital project, would probably be counted as roughly equivalent to a peer-reviewed journal article. Generally speaking, journal articles are faster, cheaper, and easier to produce than digital scholarship. The message in essence for her has been that she could choose to work harder and be rewarded less, but why would she? Another has been warned that the importance of collaboration in digital scholarship makes it particularly dangerous before tenure. For instance, if he is co-PI on a digital project, his work might be given the weight of approximately half a journal article, because surely someone else has been doing half of the work. Presumably, the more people he works on with the digital project, the less credit he will earn towards tenure and promotion, as if shared labor is a zero-sum game or some kind of tidy pie that can be cut up and served out in easy, measurable pieces. I have been repeatedly told that a book plus articles are the only things that can make me bulletproof for tenure. And I have been fed a steady diet of horror stories of productive colleagues losing their tenure cases at the program de and department level, at the dean's office, at the university-wide committee, and at SUNY Central, all because they did not have a book. As an early career researcher who came of age as a scholar in the midst of the 2008 global economic crisis and watched all of the jobs dry up and never come back, I am the researcher that Bethany Nowiski warned us about in 2011. Driven by anxiety, I am reluctant to challenge long-standing systems. With eyes on tenure or promotion, or as I have come to think of it, hopefully not being fired, I have chosen to de-emphasize innovative work that I fear will not fit my colleagues' preconception of a valid or significant scholarly contribution. I do not want to be misunderstood. Under the leadership of Amy Gay and Nancy Um, there are exciting things happening in digital scholarship in the humanities at Binghamton University. But although Amy and Nancy and I stand in our, our comrades in arms in our shared commitment to digital methods, we stand in very different places institutionally. Nancy is an associate dean with tenure. Amy and I are both in tenure track positions, but in the libraries, Amy's tenure case is explicitly linked to her success and engagements in digital scholarship. By contrast, for pre-tenure research and teaching faculty housed in academic departments, the stories we trade and the quiet conversations we share demonstrate a general lack of trust. We do not believe that enough senior faculty who will be voting on whether or not we get to keep our jobs will honor any digital work as sufficiently scholarly. This nagging sense that, um, sorry, this nagging sense that digital scholarship is unsafe and off limits before tenure affects faculty members' morale and our retention. I have recently relaunched my digital scholarship agenda with the project Richard Coeur de Lyon, a medieval multi-text, for which I am co-PI, along with my colleague Kate Noreko at the University of Washington. Kate and I are both assistant professors, and we're playing it safe and writing monographs for tenure. But Kate intends to use our project as the centerpiece of her case for going for promotion to full professor, although she also intends to have a second book project well underway and several additional journal articles just in case. <laughs> if Kate can be promoted to full, based largely on our shared digital scholarship, but I can only earn the equivalent credit of a journal article, doing the same work but gaining a significantly smaller reward. This arguably disincentivizes my staying at the institution that has nourished my career thus far. But the negative impacts of a campus culture that devalues pre-tenure digital scholarship extend beyond individual faculty members' relative happiness and our presence. 
Our institutions lose out when creative digital projects are disincentivized. And for those of us that, who work at public institutions, our local communities are work, missing out too. To make my case about this larger loss, here's my thought experiment about a parallel universe in which I continued to pursue the active research agenda that I had when I began my job. In 2014, when I was a Mellon-funded postdoctoral fellow in data curation for medieval studies at Stanford University Libraries, I served as the photographer's assistant in the digitization of a single 15th century book of hours, Stanford University Libraries M0379. This was not my actual job, but I begged for the opportunity to try my hand at the foundational work of digitization in order to better understand the unseen labor and the laborers woven through the massive digital medieval manuscript archives whose metadata I was curating. In the memoranda that I helped draft arguing for the digitization of this battered, smoke-stained, fascinating little book, I suggested that it was the perfect case study for a vast array of digital projects. Students in book history and paleography courses could learn the basics of transcription using this book. Rather than having these classes repeat the same tired transcription exercises semester after semester and year after year, we could have students write the next set of assignments as part of their final project for the next class so that over the arc of years, all of these students working together with me and anyone else who was interested could collaboratively transcribe and write a new history of this unstudied book. We could recover the hidden histories of the book's owners that are recorded in these copious reader's marks that have never been studied. We could map the book's movement across time and space from 20, uh, 15th century Ghent to 21st century Silicon Valley. When I gave my job talk at Binghamton in January 2015, I made this case for my audience. It was a public part of my active research agenda through which I gained this job. My alternative tenure timeline begins with my arrival in that parallel universe home campus that was ready to reward digital scholarship and digital pedagogy at tenure and promotion. In that timeline, shortly after I arrived in upstate New York, I realized that Stanford University Libraries M0379 has rich New York and specifically upstate connections. According to the bookseller's note, this book was one of 52 books found among the ruins of Morell's storage house after the Great Fire, which, on the 10th of October, 1881, destroyed over 2,000 volumes from the library of Henry Van Schaik. Henry Van Schaik is a descendant of Gossen Gerrits Van Schaik, who emigrated from Utrecht to the Dutch colony of New Nederland in 1637, and then on to upstate New York in 1665, the Van Schaiks became one of the major families in the early history of Albany. Van Schaik Island is named after them, and it's just up the river from where we're meeting today. Papers of the Van Schaik family are held in the New York State Library and in Cornell University. In this universe, nearly all of my research time has been dedicated to revising peer-reviewed journal articles and writing my analog book, with a brief foray into a co-publishing with librarians a report on information literacy instruction, an act which has received very mixed reviews by senior scholars on my home campus. But in my alternative tenure timeline, I was able to spend some of my research time not just feverishly writing books and articles, but writing grants to support student travel and student training using the Van Schaik family collections. This is an alternative universe and not fairyland. So the first of my grant applications were rejected, as grants generally are in their early iterations. But eventually, by strategically partnering with Binghamton University's research division, as well as collaborators at Binghamton and Albany ad uh, adjacent SUNY schools, we succeeded. Graduate, schools, uh, graduate students and advanced undergraduates at multiple SUNY institutions have received hands-on training at the State Library and at Cornell. We have transcribed and, when allowed, digitized archival documents related to M0379 and the Van Schaik family more broadly. Then, working together in this alternative universe, students, faculty, and staff on a variety of different SUNY campuses have together used this one book of hours to launch several different interconnected projects. Importantly, this fictional collaborative team has gotten to define relevance in terms of their own interests and not my own targeted book-related questions. 
So while I've combed through papers looking for mentions of medieval manuscripts and rare books, trying to lock in that Van Schaik family connection, other students and other faculty and staff have done very different things. Economics majors with medieval minors have written up reports on the latest uh, late medieval pigment trade. Students interested in gender have attempted to track down or at least contextualize a woman named on folio 108 recto, Joanna Therese, and they've used her name to try to contextualize the experiences of literacy in, for women in the early modern period. Accounting majors who have appeared in my classes seeking desirable general education requirements have traced the lawsuits against John H. Morell, owner of that supposedly fireproof warehouse that burned in 1881. And these students have gone on to write about the rise of the insurance industry or fire coverage. Other students have studied lawsuits filed against Henry Van Schaik when Mrs. Catherine Jennings sued him because she fell into an uncovered coal hole in the front of his house in New York City and broke her leg. The case has climbed, that case climbed all the way to the New York Supreme Court, and so our students' research has been able to do so as well. We carry to medieval manuscripts the urgent questions of our own times, and so in this alternative universe, as conversations about race and racism in the United States have grown more public and more heated in the past few years, so too has our digital scholarship. Among the family papers of the Van Scheidt family in the New York State Library and at Cornell are 18th century documents recording the sale of human beings, as well as letters by mem members of the Van Scheidt family concerning runaway slaves. In that parallel universe, where collaborative digital scholarship and digital pedagogy is rewarded at crucial moments for tenure and promotion, we in this room share students who are working to excavate and write uncomfortable and important new public histories of slavery in upstate New York. And at the center of it all is this battered, small, remarkable, little medieval book. In that alternative universe, over the past five years, our cross-campus collaborations have given rise to new training opportunities, new research networks, and okay, I'm just going to embrace Fairyland for one moment, new job opportunities and job placement for our shared students. They have gone on to gain some small media attention too, which we've then used to show how the humanities and libraries in the SUNY system are deeply involved in helping students do the real work of scholarship, engaging in hands-on research and making new knowledge. One of the unanticipated benefits of our work together on M0379 in that alternative universe is that we have developed honed workflows and research infrastructures for launching this kind of ever-growing, shifting digital project hub. In this universe, in December 2018, Binghamton University acquired two illuminated books of ours through the support of the Breslauer Foundation and donors Alex Huppé and Rita Bernardo. In this world, we have no collaborative research partnerships in place. We have no cross-campus teams, no grad students and undergraduates trained up and excited about archival studies already pursuing their own research. All of this still needs to be built from scratch. And since the manuscript's arrival on campus seven months ago, I haven't had time to even think about building any of it because I've been desperately trying to finish writing my book. It's 10 months since we purchased these books at auction and they have yet to be the focus of the sustained study that they and our students and our donors richly deserve. But in that alternative universe, our digital scholarship research networks are already tested and strong. And so we've been able to immediately move into the study of these new books. Indeed, we've been able to extend our studies in really exciting new ways. French departments have gotten involved because the annotations in our new books are in French. Biology departments are interested in partnering with us to do non-invasive DNA testing and map out the relations of the animals whose skins were used to make these books. Even better, we've begun seeking outside grant funding to partner with the Luma Foundation in Binghamton. In this universe, I have been dreaming about doing this since I arrived on campus four years ago, just in time for the first Luma Projection Festival. But being a scholarly point person on an art projection project based on medieval illumination has always been a step too far. 
as badly as I want to do this work, and as much as it might actually fit with the description of what our faculty handbook says should be rewarded, I don't trust enough of my seniors colleagues to reward that labor when it comes to tenure. In the alternative universe, though, we've gone for it. We're bringing in art and media students and faculty and local artists through strate strategic partnership with no local nonprofits like the Department of Public Art to make original, medieval, manuscript-inspired art. Art, that I would add, is deeply connected to the latest research and debates on medieval manuscript studies. Next year, when we project this new art onto downtown Binghamton buildings as part of that increasingly famous local upstate New York projection arts festival, Binghamton University and Albany University and other public institutions are joining the, have joined, will be joining the ranks of internationally renowned institutions using projection and other immersive digital technologies to open medieval manuscripts to entirely new audiences and modes of study. Digital scholarship, as Lorna Hughes and Andrew Prescott have argued, should be eclectic, haphazard, hands-on, and experimental. But in this universe, at this moment, in my current institution, haphazard, eclectic, and experimental do not appear to be valued before tenure. Indeed, they may well be punished with the denial of tenure and the loss of job, wages, health care, and so on that goes with it. The good news is that by gathering today, we're taking steps to address on-the-ground conditions that may be keeping local pre-tenure faculty from doing digital scholarship. At Binghamton, for example, Nancy Um has sacrificed some of her research and teaching time to take that to take do value valuable administrative work, uh, which puts her in a position to advocate for people like me. Indeed, when I began putting pressure on the heads of the English department and medieval studies programs, seeking written statements on the relative value they would assign to my newly relaunched digital scholarship agenda, they both immediately said they would turn to Nancy for help. Change is in the air. I trust you enough to lay out all of the reasons that I abandoned my active digital research agenda for five years. But change, like digital scholarship itself, is slow, messy, and haphazard. My trust that I can tell you these things is predicated on the fact that my book manuscript is out for review. <laughs> In the 1974 report, Computers and the Medievalist, the Medieval Academy of America called for the creation of its own monastic libraries to further develop the precursors of digital scholarship in medieval studies. Almost 50 years later, we still lag behind this ambitious goal because achieving it requires carving out spaces at multiple levels within and across institutions in which digital scholarship and digital labor are rewarded in measurable and material ways. Irish monastic libraries contributed enormously to the preservation and dissemination of texts in Western Europe in the early Middle Ages, but they did so because at all levels of the monastic orders, that work was believed to matter. Achieving the long-promised successes of digital scholarship today will require serious, sustained, ongoing, person-to-person -person work on every campus until the realities on the ground align with the promises of the job ads and the faculty handbooks. Thank you. Um, my question is for Bridget. Thank you for a very frank and eye-opening presentation. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the main benchmark for tenure is production of peer-reviewed scholarship. So in your alternative universe, are these digital projects peer-reviewed before going live, and what does that review process look like? Um, I actually want to pass the torch there to Rupika because I know she's published on this, actually. Um, and I would just say that I think part of that person-to-person -person work involves finding the scholarship that's out there and then people in positions of power putting pressure on committees to help them see that. I don't think that it can be managed entirely by those of us going up for the cases, um, but because of people like Rupika, I think we really do have systems in place for that. Um. Uh -oh, wow. oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, say thank you, thank you, Bridget, Bridget and thank you for your talks. Uh, no, I'm getting feedback. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I actually I went through this recently because I went up for tenure last year, 
Uh, one of the things that I, I realized was it's really wonderful that the Modern Language Association and the American Historical Association have written these wonderful guidelines for the evaluation of digital scholarship for tenure and promotion, and then no one on the tenure and promotion committees actually read them. <laughs> and so uh, one, one um, thing I noticed in the letters that I had uh, written from external reviewers is that one of them had actually gone through the criteria from the MLA with regards to one of my projects. And you know, in her letter, she had said, all her projects do these, let me go through this one particular example. And she painstakingly laid out how a project fulfilled all those criteria. So I think part of the work there uh, is on uh, senior faculty uh, who are in the positions to do these kind of evaluations to actually do them to use these mechanisms that exist because they speak at least try to speak in a language that um, humanities uh, scholars understand and the other is there are a number of really interesting initiatives that are trying to actually do peer review of digital scholarship and actually one of them is a journal called reviews in digital humanities that's new that i'm the co-editor of with jennifer giuliano at iupui who's a digital historian and uh, what we're trying to do is actually provide peer reviews of projects. And there have been, uh, the landscape of peer review for projects is part of the reason um, that that there's challenges for people doing digital scholarship pre-tenure. Um, there are sometimes, there are a few journals that can periodically publish reviews. And then there have been a number of uh, initiatives over time that have failed. So what Jennifer and I did was go and interview all the people who had failed and pick their brains about what could we do differently around the review process and around um, the structure of the journal to, uh, to change things. And so we think of it a little bit like if any of you are in the classics, the Bryn Mawr Review uh, Journal is a classics journal that book does book reviews. So we're kind of starting with that as a model with the idea of uh, doing essentially post-publication peer review of digital scholarship. Uh, and so we, we just received our first submissions in September, so uh, I can let you know how that goes. <laughs> but we have projects out for review. We developed really robust mechanisms around review that also are, are connected to the MLA and AHA review guidelines. So we're hoping that we can intervene in a gap in providing peer review of digital scholarship that hopefully people can then put into their portfolios and say, look, my digital scholarship has been thoroughly vetted by a community of peers, like an article, like a book. So then I guess it's not just the uh, alternative universe, but in this universe, it's happening. Any other questions? Any more take questions? So I have one, if no one's going to shout me down. Uh, uh, so I think today we saw some really awesome scholarship this morning and the potential for how digital scholarship can help us make our, our understand our world better. But we also um, talked about the importance of compensating and supporting uh, the labor that's required for this work and also the limitations of old models for assessing um, and this work for faculty and tenure promotion. So in sort of our current higher ed climate, which we have um, cannot get new positions normally, and even the positions that we are trying to replace don't always go through, is this work possible to start at other new institutions? Um, well, I can go first. Uh, OK, you can just hear me. Um, <laughs> So it's definitely possible. As I said in the presentation, I mean, I'm, I'm a one-woman service right now, and it's been possible. We've done many things in the libraries already in just two years. Um, it doesn't have to be done at a rapid pace. It can be slow. Um, it's a process, and things will continuously change, and needs will change, and projects will change. So there's nothing wrong with working on something now, experimenting, which um, I think you said it. 
digital scholarship in itself is experimental and just just keep growing with the process and trying new things and some things will come out great you may even build a new tool out of something that you're doing um, or have some great presentations like we saw from Rob earlier today um, but don't it, it's not a race I mean I feel like a bit of an imposter on this panel of uh, two people who are doing the work and I'm just sort of planning doing the work um, but I would say it's it's not just possible it's vital uh, this is a very different way of organizing our arguments but I think our keynote speaker showed us how powerful those arguments can be um, and the reach of that really important work has been so much more than a traditional book or peer-reviewed article will be. Um, I think what we're getting is the slow, messy investment is absolutely necessary. The valuing of that labor, not just sort of in like empty platitudes, but valuing it in terms of like making sure people get paid um, and aren't exploited and all of that. Um, like it has to be done, but I think the work has to be done. We can't go back. It's already out there. So it's on us to decide if we want to be part of what's happening right now, or if we're content being musty and not joining in. Hey, Kat, I, uh, just com I, I'm not in the tenure stream, and that has been kind of liberatory. And I would not get, I mean, it's clear, my colleagues in the history department, they've been arguing about how to work, work how much or little digital humanities or digital history should count for tenure interview, and the, the little have won that battle, as far as I can tell. I would clearly not be remotely uh, qual. They would. I would not get tenure in that department. They. They. they uh, I think they happy having me as as uh, as a as a colleague at the university, but they would not be happy to have me as a colleague at an associate level in the department. Uh, we have like one or two more minutes. Any more questions? So I guess it's time for lunch. So um, enjoy lunch and then come back for at 1.45. Okay. Thank you very much to our panel. Yes, thank you very much to our panel.